Now we're going to talk about graphing rational functions. So there's several steps that we go through to graph a rational function. And I'm not going to, as usual, I'm not going to read through these one by one. But you can read through them. And, of course, I'm going to use them to help us graph. And I'm going to try really hard to stay with my color coding here. So we'll see how I do. Oh, I've got color code there. Nice. So, graph f of x equals x minus 1 over x squared minus 4. So the first thing we do is find the domain. To find the domain, we need to simplify. So we find out if we've got a hole or an asymptote. On the bottom, it's going to factor to be x plus 2 times x minus 2. So nothing's going to cancel out. And we'll take those on the bottom and set them both equal to zero. So uh, we cannot use x equals negative 2 or positive 2. It's going to be asymptotes there. So the domain would be negative infinity to negative 2, not included, unioned with negative 2 to 2, not included, unioned with 2 to infinity. I've already put it in lowest terms, so I'm just going to rewrite that. Factoring it completely is the same as lowest terms. Then we want to find our intercepts. So we both want both x-intercepts and y-intercepts. So remember, to find an x-intercept, we let y be 0. So we'll say 0 equals x minus 1 over x squared minus 4. Now, the nice thing is when we multiply both sides by x squared minus 4, the bottom just goes away. So whenever you're finding an x-intercept of a rational function, you can just discard the bottom altogether. So x is equal to 1. So where x equals 1, there's an x-intercept. So I'm going to go ahead and draw that on my graph. Then... We want our y-intercept. Whenever we want a y-intercept, we let x be 0. So we'll have negative 1 over negative 4 or 1 fourth. So our y-intercept is at 0, 1 fourth. So, something like that. And we'll go back up. Our x-intercept was at 1, 0. I'll write that out. Okay, next. And I've already got them on the next picture for us. The vertical asymptotes. So, for the vertical asymptotes, again, you take the bottom. And it was already factored for us. We had this. And set the bottom equal to zero. And you don't have to do this over again. We did it when we found the domain, but just to show you. So your vertical asymptotes are at x equals negative 2 and x equals 2. So I'm going to go ahead and plot them in here. And then it asks us if there are any horizontal or oblique asymptotes. If we look at the original function where it's multiplied, not factored, then we can see that the degree on the top 
which is 1, is less than the degree on the bottom, 2. So what does that tell us about horizontal asymptotes? Y equals 0. And if there's a horizontal asymptote, there shouldn't be a slant. So we're not going to worry about that dividing. So there's our horizontal asymptote. Kind of hard to see there, but you get the idea. Okay, next, intervals. Okay, we need some other points here. I cannot tell what this looks like from looking at it right now. So what we've got to do is we've got to pick some intervals. And what we do is we pick intervals between our intercepts and between our vertical asymptotes and on either side. So the first interval I'm going to pick is over here. So from negative infinity to negative 2. The second interval that I'm going to pick is here between the asymptote and my y-intercept. So negative 2 to 0. The next one between the y-intercept and the x-intercept. So zero between 0 and 1. Then between the x-intercept and the asymptote there, so between 1 and 2, and then to the right of that asymptote, so between 2 to infinity. So I've picked the intervals. So you just pick an x value within that interval. So the easiest x value to pick within negative infinity to 2 would be x equals negative 3. So you plug in f of negative 3. So we're plugging in negative 3 for x. I'm just going to write this out on the first one, not on every one. We're just plugging in negative 3 for x. We get negative 4 over Forgot my squared. That'll be 9 minus 4, which is 5. So that tells us that there is a point on this graph at negative 3, negative 4 fifths. Now, I know it's hard to graph negative 4 fifths. Just get as close as you can. So negative 3, negative 4 fifths. That's just before negative 1. So something like that. And then we go through and do the rest of them. F of... I'm going to pick negative 1 to be between negative 2 and 0. I don't pick negative 3 halves because why make something harder than you have to? So when you plug in negative 1, you get 2 thirds. So there's a point at negative 1, 2 thirds. About right there. And then, between 0 and 1, oh, we are going to have to use a decimal here. I'm going to use 0. 0.5. Plug that in, you get 2 thirteenths. Jeez, that's tiny. So, somewhere where x is, you know, it's, it's really close to 0. You got to get from there to here, so that makes sense. Then, between 1 and 2, we're going to have to use a decimal again. I'm going to use 1.5. You could use a fraction if that's easier for you. That gives us negative 2 sevenths. So something like that. And 2 to infinity, let's just choose 3. And you get 2 fifths. So that would be the point 3, 2 fifths. About right there. Okay, so we've got several points here. I'm missing a couple.
There we go. Now we want to last, I think this is the last, find the behavior near the asymptotes. So what's happening near the asymptotes? So as x approaches negative infinity, what are we going up or down? Well, as we go to negative infinity, we have to go through this point here, and it has to get closer and closer to zero because that's our horizontal asymptote. Next, as x approaches, we'll look at this asymptote negative 2 from the left. We're going, it's not going to turn up like this, obviously. It's going to go down to negative infinity. Okay. As x approaches that asymptote negative 2 from the right, well, we've got this stuff going on in here. We're not going to turn and go down. It's going to have to go up from there. Why are we not going down? Because there's not an x-intercept there. So up to infinity. And then as x approaches 2 from the left, guess what we're doing? We're going down. Negative infinity. And last... As x approaches infinity, so as we move to the right, what's it going to do from this point? It's going to get closer to zero. And okay, so it's going to have to come up there. And so that's what our graph looks like, as close as we can graph it by hand anyway. So basically, I'm just going through and we're going to look at several examples because the more examples we look at, the better off you'll be in your notes. So the next one is f of x equals x squared minus 1 over x. Find the domain. We know the bottom can't be 0. Well, that was it. That was easy. So the domain will be negative infinity to infinity, no, excuse me, to zero, unioned with zero to infinity. Lowest terms would be, we can factor the top, x plus one times x minus one. The bottom's just x, and nothing cancels out. So we have an asymptote at x equals zero, not a, a whole. The intercepts, x-intercept, let y be 0, so 0 equals x squared minus 1 over x, so 0 just equals the top, so x is plus or minus the square root of 1, which is 1. So we have two x-intercepts. We have one at negative 1, 0, and one at 1, 0. And then the y-intercept, let x be 0. We're dividing by 0, so guess what this means? No y-intercepts. So vertical asymptotes, again, set the bottom equal to zero. It's just x equals zero. Horizontal or oblique asymptotes. 
I'm going to have to go up here. I didn't leave my space, blow up a lot of space down at the bottom. We had this as our function. Where the top is 2 and the bottom, the degree was 1. So the top is greater than the bottom. When that's the case, there is no horizontal asymptote. Which means that there could be a vertical asymptote. I mean, excuse me, a, an oblique or slant asymptote. So we're going to have to divide. We divide x into x squared minus 1. x goes into x squared x times. Subtract. We've got a remainder of negative 1, but we don't care about the remainder. So the top is our slant asymptote. y equals x. And y equals x goes through, it's just a line, with a y-intercept of 0 and a slope of up 1 over 1. And now we need to choose our intervals. So we'll start with to the left of our x-intercept. So negative infinity to negative 1. And then we'll pick an interval between our x-intercept and our both our asymptotes there in this case. So negative 1 to 0. Then between our asymptotes and 1, 0 to 1. And last, bigger than our, our x-intercept. So somewhere from 1 to infinity. So, for this first one, it's got to be less than negative 1. So, let's just pick negative 2. So, we got on the top, negative 2 squared minus 1 over negative 2. That'll give us... As a decimal negative 1.5. So our first point is at negative 2, negative 1.5, or negative 3 halves. But I changed it to a decimal because negative 3 halves would be top heavy, and we want to um, be able to graph it easy. So negative 2, negative 1.5 is something like that. Between negative 1 and 0, we're going to have to pick 0.5 f of 0.5, when you plug that in, you should get or negative 1.5 or negative 0.5, you get 1.5. So we've got a point at negative 0.5, 1.5. Then we'll plug in 0.5. We get negative 1.5, so there's a point at 0.5, negative 1.5, and then 1 to infinity, let's choose 2. f of 2, got another 1.5, so we've got a point at 2, 1.5. I think I graphed that, this one wrong. Should be down here. Sorry about that. The behavior near the asymptotes. Okay. So, as x approaches negative infinity, f of x approaches so as we go to the left, what's going to happen? It's going to have to go down here. 
It's not going to go that way or up that way or anything like that. And you can tell that by the points you've already got graphed. So it's got to go down, getting closer to this slant asymptote, but not crossing it. I still don't like it. There we go. So negative infinity. No, it's not going straight down, but it's still going down. We could also say it depends on what um, the math program wants. Yeah, it's going to negative infinity. We could also say that it's approaching the line y equals x, which it is. So here's the line y equals x. So it just depends on what it asks for specifically. As x approaches our vertical asymptote 0 from the left, we're going to be, if we connect these dots and connect them in a curve, because it's not a straight line there, we've got to keep going up. So positive infinity. As x approaches 0 from the right, So this way, these points, once we connect them, we're going to have to keep going down. So that would be negative infinity. And as x approaches infinity, we're going up. So again, it's either infinity or, depending on what the program asks, or it could be asking for it is approaching the line y equals x again. And there it is. Okay. Let's look at yet another example. I know you might be getting tired of this, but the more we look at, the better. I will speed up a little bit, though. Take the bottom to find the domain. Set it equal to zero. X is zero, so we cannot have zero on the bottom. Negative infinity to zero unioned with zero to infinity will be our domain. This one is already in lowest terms because the top cannot be factored because of that plus one. The intercepts, so for the x-intercept, let y be 0, so we've got 0 equals x to the 4th plus 1 over x squared. So 0 is x to the 4th plus 1. x to the 4th is negative 1. We cannot take the 4th root. of a negative number, just like we can't take the square root of a negative number. If it was a third root, we could, but not if it's an even root. So there's no x-intercepts. Look for y-intercepts. So plug in 0 for x. We're getting a zero on the bottom, which you can't have. So that tells us that there's no y-intercepts either. This graph is not crossing the x-axis or the y-axis. You're going to see it in a little bit. It looks a little bit funny. Vertical asymptotes. Do we have any? Well, it's at the bottom equal to zero. Yep, there's a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. Horizontal and oblique asymptotes. Again, I'm going to have to go up above it. So, let's see. The 
Ugh, my cat just sat on my paper. Finnick. The list tonight. Okay, the degree of the top is 4, and the degree of the bottom is 2. So that means the degree of the top is greater than the degree of the bottom. What does this tell us? That there is no horizontal asymptote. Could there be an oblique asymptote? Let's see. We divide x squared into x to the fourth plus 1. x squared goes into x to the fourth, x squared times. x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. Subtract, we've got a remainder of 1, which we don't care about. So, the top is y equals x squared. Now, we don't call that an oblique asymptote or a slant asymptote because it's not a line. So, it's not technically an asymptote. But this, the graph of y equals x squared will be a guide to us. And you'll see why in a minute. So, we'll graph y equals x squared. It's the parabola that goes through 1, 1 and 2, 4, and negative 1, 1, and negative 2, 4. And so we'll see what that looks like in a minute. So, intervals. Well, we pick a number less than zero, so negative infinity to zero. We need to pick a number in here somewhere. It's hard to write that interval, but we know negative one is in this interval, so we're going to choose negative 1 as one of the numbers to plug in. If we were using negative infinity to 0 and we need to be to the left of the parabola, then we could choose, say, f of negative 2. Then we need a number in here, so let's choose f of 1. And we need another a number over here. So let's choose f of 2. Okay. So negative 2, let's see what that gets us. It's negative 2 to the 4th plus 1 over negative 2 squared. Negative 2 to the fourth is 16. Negative 2 squared is 4. So we have 17 over 4. I'm going to need to change that to a decimal. We get 4.25. So we've got the point negative 2, 4.25. Then let's do f of negative 1. f of negative 1 gives us 2. So we've got the point negative 1, 2. f of 1 also gives us 2. And f of 2, when we plug that in, we'll also get 
Okay, what's happening near our asymptotes? So, as x approaches negative infinity to start with, So as we're going to the left, this is going to have to approach our, the graph y equals x squared. Or like I said with the last problem, it's going up, so it's approaching positive infinity. Then this is coming back down to this dot. As x approaches 0 from the left, what's happening? Well, we don't have another dot graphed on there. But it's not going to come down and do that thing. Not that it couldn't cross the, the um, y equals x squared, but it's just not likely. We're using that y equals x squared as a graph or as a guide. So what it's actually doing is coming back like this. So as x approaches 0 from the left, f of x approaches infinity. As x approaches 0 from the right, it's doing the same thing. f of x approaches infinity. I'm supposed to have an arrow there. I got too many arrows in here now. There we go. And then last as x approaches positive infinity, so as we go to the right, it's going up through that dot and getting closer to the graph of y equals x squared or infinity. So, Funny looking graph. That's what it looks like. Okay, let's look at an example. We've got, want to look at an example where we've got a hole, and then we're going to look at something a little bit different. So, for this one, again, to find the domain, set the bottom equal to zero. So we can't include negative three or three. So the domain will be negative infinity to negative three unioned with negative three to three unioned with three to infinity. The lowest terms. The top can be factored, and I'm not going to go and do that for you, but the top factors to be 2x plus 1 times x minus 4, and the bottom factors to be x plus 3 times x minus 3. And that should have been... A three up here. There we go. So you can see that the x minus threes cancel out. So the 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 function in lowest terms is two x plus one over x plus three, and that's what the graph will look like. X Except there's a hole at where x minus 3 equals 0. So a hole at x equals 3.
the intercepts. So to find the x-intercept, we let y be 0. And we can use that lowest terms, the 2x plus 1 over x plus 3. So 0 is 2x plus 1. So there's an x-intercept at negative one-half zero. And for the y-intercept, let x be zero. So there's a y-intercept at zero, one-third. Really close to each other there. Vertical asymptotes are holes. So set the bottom equal to zero. We have x plus three times x minus three. So set both of those equal to zero. And we already talked about the fact since the x minus three is the one that canceled out then that's the one where there is a hole. So x equals negative 3 is a vertical asymptote. We need to figure out where this hole is. To find the hole, you can plug 3 into that reduced form. So 2 times 3 plus 1 over 3 plus 3. That'll give us 7 sixth. 1 and 1 sixth. A little bit over 1. So the hole is at 3 and a little bit over 1. So right there. And I'm going to draw that in. If you graph this in a graphing calculator, it's not going to show you the hole. But if you put in x equals 3 to trace then it's not going to give you a y value. So the hole's there, you just can't see it on the graph. The horizontal asymptote, we need to look back at our original function before we factored. And here, the degree of the top is 2, and the degree of the bottom is 2. So when the degree of the top is equal to the degree of the bottom, remember we talked about this in the last section, then the y-intercept is the numbers out front. So the y-intercept would be y equals 2 over 1 or y equals 2. Okay, so... Let's find our intervals. We need to be to the left of negative 3. So somewhere negative th infinity to negative 3. So let's pick f of negative 4. And we'll plug in the first one, but not the rest. So, And we can plug into that um, reduced form. So 2 times negative 4 plus 1 over negative 4 plus 3 is 7. So we have the point negative 4, 7. Then we need to choose between the vertical asymptote and our x-intercept. So somewhere between negative 3 and negative 
what was it, 0.5? So just pick, I'm just going to pick negative 1. And f of negative 1 is negative 1 half. So we've got a point at negative 1, negative 1 half. Right there. Now, you do not need to pick an interval in here. It's pretty obvious what it's going to do. It's going to connect those dots. Don't worry about that. Let's do pick an interval between our y-intercept and our hole. So between 0 and 3. So f of 1 is 3 fourths. So we've got a point at 1 3 fourths. And then we need to pick greater than the hole and we'll be done. So somewhere greater than 3. F of 4 will work. You get 9 sevenths. That's 1 and 2 sevenths, so a little over 1. Maybe right there. Okay, lastly, the behavior near the asymptotes. So let's focus on this down here first. It's pretty clear that these are going to connect like that, with that whole that x equals negative 3, or excuse me, x equals 3. And we're going to go down, and we're going to go up, getting closer to that asymptote. This one, we don't have any more um, points, so we could, we could plot more points if you're not sure. But what's going to happen is it's not going to go down over the horizontal asymptote. It's going to get close to the vertical asymptote. And then it's going to come down and eventually get close to the horizontal asymptote. So as x approaches negative infinity, f of x approaches the horizontal asymptote x equals or y equals two, so two. And then as x approaches negative three from the left f of x approaches, it's going up to infinity. As x approaches negative 3 from the right, we're going down to negative infinity. And as x approaches infinity, so we're going to the right, it's going up to that horizontal asymptote 2. And so that's what our graph looks like. And there's a clearer picture of it. Okay, we've got two more examples to go. For the first one, we're going to make up a rational function that might have the graph shown in the picture. Picture. Okay. So let's start with our x-intercepts. The x-intercepts here would be at, that's negative 2. So x equals negative 2. And the, at x equals negative 2, it touches. And when we touch, remember, it has an even multiplicity.
So that means our factor, if x equals negative 2, our factor would be x plus 2. And since it has an even multiplicity, I'm just going to use 2 as the exponent. You could use 4, 6, 8, whatever. I'm just going to use 2. The next intercept is at 5. Here, we cross. Which means that there is an odd multiplicity. So the factor would be x minus 5. And the exponent, I'm just going to use 1. So, so far, having those x-intercepts, the top, p of x, let's say that r of x will be p of x over q of x. So the in x-intercepts tells us that the top is going to be that factorization of x plus 2 squared times x minus 5. And like I said, we could use another even exponent or another odd, but we don't have to. We could even put a number out here, but we don't have to. What will tell us what's on the bottom? What's on the bottom is where we are not defined, so where there are vertical asymptotes. So there's a vertical asymptote at at x equals Where is that? Negative 5. So that means that there's a factor, x plus 5, on the bottom. Now, how do we tell the multiplicity from the bottom? It's similar to cross and touch because... At x equals negative 5, it's going up and down. So that's kind of like a cross. So that means that there is an odd multiplicity. So we can just leave our exponent at 1. Now, the other vertical asymptote is at x equals 2. This one has an even multiplicity. Why? Because it's going down and down. If it went up and up on either side, then it would also be even. So, down and down is kind of, or up and up is kind of like touching, and going up and down is kind of like crossing. So we have an even multiplicity, so the factor x minus 2 has to be to an even power. We'll just use squared. So q of x could be x plus 5 times x minus 2 squared. So, so far, oh, I'm running out of space. So, so far we have the function r of x equals, on the top, x plus 2 squared times x minus 5, and on the bottom, x plus 5 times x minus 2 squared. Now, there's one more thing that we have to take into account, and that is the horizontal asymptote. So, the degree on the top 
has to be equal to the degree on the bottom to get a horizontal asymptote of y equals 2. So in this case, we've got 3 and 3, so we're good. We wouldn't want to make this exponent 4 and leave the one on the bottom 2 because that would not allow us to have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 2. Something else that we need to allow a horizontal asymptote at y equals 2 would be a 2 on top. Because for a horizontal asymptote where the top degree equals the bottom degree, then the numbers out front are what our asymptote is. So it would have to be 2 over 1. So this is what our function would look like. And we could multiply that all out, but we don't have to. Now, there could be other variations for this function, but that was just the easiest way to do it, so that's how we'll leave it. The last example we're going to look at is a real-world problem. Reynolds Metal Company manufactures aluminum cans in the shape of a cylinder with a capacity of 500 cubic centimeters. The top and bottom of the can are made of a special aluminum alloy that costs five hundredths of a cent. That's not five cents. That's five hundredths of a cent. That's a good thing. Per square, square centimeter. The sides are made of a material that costs two hundredths of a cent per square centimeter. Express the cost of material for the can as a function of the radius of the can. Okay. So the first thing we want to talk about is the volume. We have that the volume is 500 cubic centimeters. And we're all in centimeters here, so that's good. And volume of a cylinder is pi r squared h. If you have a problem like this on your homework or lab or something, then most likely it will tell you that. You're not expected to have that memorized still. So since both of those are the volume, then we can set them equal to each other. So let's stop with that for a minute, and we'll come back to it in a second. Okay. We need our can, or the area of the can, in terms of the radius. So let's look at a picture of our can here. So here's the can, and here's what it looks like all spread out. Now, the cost of the can isn't necessarily determined by the volume. I mean, that's a factor in it. But we're talking about the surface area because the can is created by the top at the bottom and the side. The side, when rolled out, makes a rectangle, and the top and the bottom are circles. Now, those areas you should know. A circle would be pi r squared. The area of a, I'm trying to use colors here. The area of a rectangle is length times width. So the width here would be the height. And the length is the distance around the circle. Remember the distance around the circle? The circumference. So the length is 2 
pi r. So that's how we got that the area of the rectangle is 2 pi r h. So when creating this area of the can, surface area of the can, then you have 0.05 of a cent times the area of the top and bottom. because it was 0.05 cents for the top and bottom. Plus, you have 0.02 cents times the area of the sides. So let's plug in. The area of the top and bottom well, the top is pi r squared, and the bottom is pi r squared. So the area of the top and the bottom together would be 2 times pi r squared. And the area of the side, we said, is 2 pi r h. Now what we want to do is simplify that. And again, I've not left myself much space. So if you multiply through... Oh, before I, want to, before I do that, let's do something else. We want this in terms of R. Problem, we have an H. We can't have an H. That's where that volume comes in. We can solve this formula for H and use it to plug into our surface area function. So to solve this for H, we just divide both sides by pi R squared. So in place of H... We're going to put 500 over pi r squared. If you'll notice, there's some things that will cancel out there. One of those r's will go away. A pi will go away. And let's start simplifying. So first multiply 0 0.05 by 2. And we get 0.1 pi r squared. And then multiply 0 0.02 by 2 and then by 4, well, and then by 500. That gets you 20. And we're just left with an r on the bottom. So your area function. is C of R equals 0 0.1 pi R squared plus 20 over R. B says use a graphing utility to graph it. Okay. Oh, no. I didn't graph it. Okay. Well, it's on your notes. Let's see how quickly I can sketch this. I'll pause it while I do it. Okay, so the graph on your graphing utility should look something like that. Part C says, what value of R will, re will result in the least cost? So you could find that minimum by hand, but why, if you're using a graphing utility on this already, the minimum would be right here. So on the graphing calculator, 
you would use second calc minimum or on Desmos, you just move the dot until it turns black. And this point is 3.179.47. The point is in the form R was X and C was Y. So what value of R will result in the least cost? 3.17, our units were centimeters. And then D asked, what is this least cost? Well, there's C, 9.47. But remember, it's 9.47 cents. So if we want to change that into dollars, it would look like this. And that finally concludes this section.